Sean White is a famous American snowboarder who recently won his third gold medal at the recent Winter Olympic Games. He began his career in both skateboarding and snowboarding, eventually turning pro in both sports at the age of seven. Now, he trained endlessly, and it is that training that made him an expert. But before every competition, he hones down and does a specific set of training that allows him to prepare for that competition. He takes practice runs. And during those practice runs, he assesses the speed of the slope, the, the quality of the snow, the quality of the edges of the half pipe, the nuance of the slope as he goes up for a jump and comes down. In his practice runs, he also assesses his body and his equipment and how they are working with the environment he's currently in. He's assessing form and function. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. I have, my education has culminated in the six years of residency and board certification. When my teenage children complain about high school, I remind them that I graduated after grade 35. <laughs> after that, I had the distinct pleasure of doing a year of dedicated work in pediatric neurosurgery, during which I performed over 100 operations on pediatric patients with brain tumors. Like, like an, a professional athlete, I have to complete a specific set of preparations for every patient in order to remove their brain tumor safely. I assess form and function, and let me give you some examples. JS was a, is a grade one girl who came into my clinic with episodes of difficulty speaking. She would be talking, stop talking eventually, drop whatever she had in her right hand and fall down and have a seizure. She was brought to the hospital, where they perform a series of investigations, including an EEG, which is scalp electrodes, measuring the electro electrical activity of the brain, where they discovered that seizures were coming from the left frontal lobe. She had a CAT scan, an MRI, um, which identified a tumor in the left frontal lobe. Now, before we look at this, we have to think about what we're looking at. I'll teach you a bit about neuroradiology and then you'll know everything about it. So uh, CAT scans and MRIs are designed to take a look at certain uh, large chunks of anatomy. What I tell patients is it's like putting your head through a bread slicer. And then after that, they still let me operate on them. <laughs> um, what, what is at the top is the front, and left and right uh, are designated. What the arrow shows you is that there's an area in the brain that lights up or enhances after the administration of intravenous dye. Now, the goal for this patient is for me to go in and completely remove the tumor, remove any of the brain that's causing seizures, and to not disturb function. I would then give that tissue to the pathologist, they would give me a diagnosis, and then I would be able to make a permanent plan for them, which may or may not include chemotherapy or radiation. The problem is, is that's exactly where we think the part of the brain is that makes you talk. Oh, look at that. Um, so this is an anatomical drawing of the brain. And what you can see highlighted as Broca's area is the area of the brain that we think is responsible for speech. So this is the left side. In right-handed people, we think Broca's area is on the left in approximately 95% of people. But that's 95% of people. That means that 5% of people, it's somewhere else. So let's make it more complicated. Broca's area can be exactly in that part of the brain, or it can be displaced above, behind, in front of that area. In addition to differences in left and right-handed people, dis possible displacement or disbursement, where Broca's area is larger than you would think, um, tumors can actually grow as a mass that pushes brain away, or they can grow within brain. So now what do we do? We have to identify function in order to completely remove this girl's tumor, and I have to be able to give her back to her family exactly the way she was. So let's go to an analogy. Let's think of this auditorium as a skull. So the skull and the bones and the scalp are the ceiling, the floor, and the walls. The front of the auditorium, that's me, uh, represents the front of the skull. Broca's area is highlighted uh, in green at the front. Behind that, we have a red motor strip, and that area is responsible uh, for strength of the face, arm, and leg on the opposite side. 
Behind that, we have an area highlighted in green that allows you to understand speech. Behind that, we have an area in yellow that's actually the visual brain, the part that kind of figures out what exactly you're looking at. Of course, vision starts in the eyes, proceeds post at, at the back through optic nerves, through wiring called radiations to the back. There's a motor strip on both sides, and there's vision on both sides, but speech is usually only on one side. Now let's go back to our patient. So it is extremely important for me to define function. Now how do I do that? In order to define function, I employed several tests, most simple of which was functional MRI. Functional MRI is MRI technology during which we first obtain an anatomical scan, which you're all familiar with, because now you're neuroradiologists. Um, so we identify a functional scan, and we ask the patient to sit still in the MRI scanner. We ask them to perform a number of tasks. If I want to map uh, the area of the brain that's responsible for speech, I would ask them to think of as many words as they can that begin with a certain letter like L. If I wanted to map the motor strip on the left, I would ask them to either tap their finger or tap their foot. If I wanted to map vision, I would have them look at a geometric pattern. The functional MRI then detects differences in blood flow because the areas of the brain that are activated get a little more blood flow. And then you could create a map. So we can create a map that allows us to actually draw out where the area that was activated during the attempt to produce, to think of certain numbers of words. And that is where her, Broca's area, actually is. What you don't see here is where the tumor is. The tumor is actually underneath and in front of that area of brain. Another useful test is to actually perform an MRI that looks specifically at the wiring of the brain. The brain is an electrical organ, it has wires. Wires connect one part to another. So in this drawing, the red wires are traveling from left to right, the green from front to back, and the blue from top to bottom. And the arrow indicates the area where her tumor is. So what you can tell is that there is no wiring or connections that go to that area of the brain, meaning that the tumor has displaced functioning brain. That is great news. So between the results of the fMRI and the diffusion tensor imaging, the special MRI, I can confidently tell family I can take out that tumor and still preserve her ability to speak. Of course, that takes about two seconds, during which they say, how are you going to cut her hair? <laughs> and what kind of braid can she have before surgery? How much are you going to cut during surgery? And what braid can she have after surgery? How soon can I wash her hair? And I always tell people that the, uh, the haircut you get during surgery is the worst and the most expensive haircut you will ever get. <laughs> I guarantee 100% dissatisfaction. So now that we've mapped the function of the brain, it's time to turn our attention to the anatomy of the brain and the tumor around the brain. So I have had the pleasure of working with a number of people throughout the years who have been pioneers in things like stealth technology, which I'll tell you about, um, and 3D technology, including 3D printed materials, and you can see there's a preview, um, and artificial reality. So stealth technology is essentially a GPS for the brain. What you do is you load a CAT scan or MRI in the computer that has eyes, just like Wally. -E. You register the patient's skull or the position of the patient's skull with a reference frame that's pictured there. And then the, I actually have a handheld pointer that I can use to point to the skull. And the computer screen tells me exactly where I am on the MRI. So not only can I see the scalp and the skull with my eyes, I can actually tell what's underneath. That allows me to plan the incision, to plan the removal of bone, and to actually find the tumor itself. So what's also very useful is to actually uh, make 3D printed models to identify deep regions, uh, corridors to deep tumors. When you look at a brain, when you remove the covering of the brain, you see rounded uh, mounds of tissue called uh, gyri. Between gyri are soft connective tissue that are sulci. And the sulci have no neurologic function whatsoever. 
And when you would imagine, if there's a highway that I don't have to go through brain to get deep, I'd like to identify that. Back to our analogy, if you want to get into the middle of the auditorium, you'd like to find an aisle rather than climbing over everybody in their seats. So let me introduce you to JJ. JJ was a grade one girl who was at, at the park with her parents when she suddenly slumped forward and developed a seizure. She was brought to the hospital where an MRI demonstrated that she had uh, a very deep lesion in an area of the brain called the insula. This is her, her printed brain. We were able to print the tissue in a soft, tra translucent material, the brain, and the tumor in a darker, harder material. And I was actually able to perform the surgery essentially with my fingers, with far less blood loss. So <laughs> what I was able to do was pull apart different areas of the model to actually identify a sulcus that would allow me to get as close as I could to her tumor. And indeed, the picture shows that I was able to find a sulcus that would allow me to get down to and only remove approximately four millimeters of brain before I completely removed her tumor. So that is something that actually would have been very, very difficult to do in two-dimensional imaging. So we can actually use other technologies to almost operate before we get to the operating room. So this is... Uh, me setting up my artificial reality suite. I'm wearing these fashionable goggles, and I have two handheld controllers. In this artificial reality environment, I can actually put anything I want. I can put the two-dimensional images that radiologists look at. I can actually combine all the different slices of brain to make 3D models. I can combine different 3D models, some of the blood vessels of the brain, some where I can visualize the tumor, some where I can visualize the wiring put them all together, put them in the position that I would normally place the patient before surgery, and remove certain parts like I was operating in order to really prepare myself for the anatomy that I'm going to see. Now, in that way, we're almost able to do the surgery before we get there. That means I'm really well prepared, and that's what's important. So like an elite athlete, I have spent years honing my craft. Every patient that comes into clinic represents a unique set of different challenges based on their different tumor anatomy and functional brain. Tumors can grow anywhere and they can affect any kind of function and any surgery that I plan for them can potentially disrupt their function and I don't want to do any of those things. I want to give them back minus a tumor. So I am assessing form and function in that particular patient at that particular time. And that is the epitome of individualized medicine.